This is the first of several videos on the formation of the second political party system, which includes the presidencies of John Quincy Adams and Andrew Jackson. In this first video, we'll have a, a brief overview of the election of 1824 and the presidency of John Quincy Adams. You know, the final breakup of the era of good feelings can be seen in this election of 1824, which, as we'll talk about, became known as the corrupt bargain. When President Monroe decided that he would follow the example of Washington and Jefferson and Madison and not run for a third term, jockeying for the presidency began. However, with, with only one really party coming out of the era of good feelings, the caucus system, which had chosen parties had sort of broken up, meaning that there was no system of agreeing on a candidate. And the result was a number of candidates, not just two. Among them was Monroe's Secretary of State John Quincy Adams, who thought that he was uh, best, uh, best positioned to be president because he was Secretary of State, which was seen at the time as sort of a stepping stone to the presidency. And he was generally more liked than the urban Northeast. There was William H. Crawford of Georgia, who was Monroe's Secretary of Treasury. He probably best represented the old views of the Democrat Republicans of limited government. The problem was he was 51 and he'd uh, suffered a stroke during the campaign, which left him partially paralyzed and making it difficult for him to talk. There was a heavy hitter, Henry Clay, who was Speaker of the House and, of course, Arthur of the Missouri Compromise. He was at the time 47 years old. He's from Kentucky and had tremendous experience in Congress. He also had experience in foreign policy because he traveled with John Quincy Adams to Great Britain to help negotiate the end of the War of 1812. He tended to argue for higher tariffs to promote manufacturing and a lot of federal expenditures to promote internal improvements. There was also John C. Calhoun, another formidable candidate. He was the youngest at 42, and he was a, a wealthy South Carolina planner with considerable experience in Washington, both in the House and uh, in cabinet posts. Now, despite his South Carolina background, he tended to favor protective tariffs and internal improvements like Henry Clay, but probably more for political reasons as he figured it would help him win the North to go with his South Carolina base. And the, the final candidate was General Andrew Jackson from Tennessee. He had, uh, you know, obviously no much, not much experience in Congress, and his fame really was as a military leader from the War of 1812 and the Indian fighting. In the beginning, Jackson's launch into the national election really wasn't much of a serious bid. Tennessee politicians entered his name to buy time to improve Clay's chances in the state. The idea was to tie up Crawford's support. The 1824 election was really the first presidential contest when ordinary voters mattered more. Recent changes to the state constitutions had allowed voters in all but six states to select their electors. Previously, the state's electors, the state legislatures had done it themselves. When the votes were counted, Jackson had 99 electoral votes, John Quincy Adams 84, Crawford 41, and Clay 37. But Jackson didn't have the majority required for election, and thus the election was thrown into the House of Representatives. According to the 11th Amendment of the Constitution, which reconfigured national elections in 1804, you needed a majority of the Electoral College, but uh, in the House vote, only the top three could run, and each state's delegation had to vote as one. With the fewest electoral votes, Clay was thus out, but still in a position to throw his electors behind another candidate. He ended up throwing his weight behind John Quincy Adams. John Quincy Adams thus ended up winning by one vote in the House. It made sense. Both of them favored protective tariffs and federal money for internal improvements. Also, Clay feared Jackson's quick temper and thought his military ways would uh, sort of uh, a bit scary in the, in the political world. He didn't want anybody trying to just have a military coup. To Jackson's supporters, this constituted the corrupt bargain. Clay's throwing his support behind John Quincy Adams because of what happened three days later. Adams made Clay Secretary of State. Now keep in mind again that Secretary of State was seen as the stepping stone to the presidency. And you know, Jackson said it was a quid pro quo. You know, I'll throw my support behind you and and you uh you'll be made Secretary of State. Now most historians believe that there was no actual bargain there. There, you know, it was just an appearance of a quid pro quo, nothing really, and thus nothing un, un, uh, unethical. 
But Jackson and his supporters were really ticked off and they called Clay the Judas of the West. You know, again, the Western people tended to be a little more against protective tariffs and all that. And, and here Clay was going along with uh, John Quincy Adams, who was an adherent of such things. Anyway, Jackson spent the next four years as a critic of Adams and Clay, and thus sort of, you know, building up uh, uh, his own little political opposition force. John Quincy Adams uh, winning the corrupt bargain election in 1824 served only one term. He's going to lose the 1828 election, which we'll talk about in a later video. But looking at his presidency, he's probably one of the better qualified presidents in American history. Not only was he the son of a previous, previous president, but he'd been a, an ambassador to several nations. And he had served, uh, you know, as he negotiated the treaty of Ghent. He had been active in uh, as Secretary of State under Monroe, and it helped uh, create the Monroe Doctrine. He'd, he'd been a part of the negotiations of the adam Onish Treaty. He was, by the way, a, a very prominent opponent of slavery. And so when he ran for the presidency in 1824, no one could really deny his, his prominence. In office, John Quincy Adams is going to make a, a number of proposals which would sort of strengthen federal government, which increasingly annoyed people like Jackson and all that. But he wanted, he proposed a massive program of uh, strengthening the federal government, national improvements and so forth. He called, for example, a federally sponsored program of, of roads, canals, and even harbors. And while mo must, much of his proposals failed to pass, he did get key projects, such as the Chesapeake and Delaware Canal passed. You can see here where the canal, which has been uh, in use ever since then, it's obviously been expanded, but it, it's uh, important because it connects the Delaware Bay, which goes straight out in the Atlantic Ocean with the upper Chesapeake Bay, uh, which goes, you know, accesses the Atlantic Ocean much further to the south. John Quincy Adams endorsed a, a national university in Washington and federally funded scientific research. Now, he didn't get the national university passed, but he did sign a bill for the creation of the U.S. Naval Observatory, which remains one of the oldest scientific agencies in the country. He pushed for the creation of a museum and research center for the, quote, increase and diffusion of knowledge, unquote. Now, with his help, later on, this led to the creation of the Smithsonian Institution, which was finally established in 1846. On the left here, you can see the emblem of the National Obser Naval Observatory, and on the right, with the oldest building of the Smithsonian Institution. John Quincy Adams pressed for a national decimal-based system of weights and measures. Uh, it was first proposed in a report written when he was Secretary of State, and you can see it on the right. He maintained it would benefit both commerce and science. All of this so strengthened the federal government that it did begin to worry many of the old Democratic Republicans, uh, people who, again, were stronger in the South and the West, and, and people that might uh, agree with Andrew Jackson. During John Quincy Adams' presidency, the tariff began to assume a bigger role in politics, ultimately leading to what became known as the Tariff of Abominations. Adams was for new tariff duties, larger, higher tariff duties, which largely uh, covered manufactured goods that New England manufacturers sold, thus helping them. The South and the West, of course, feared a trade war on what they exported. Jackson, you might think, would be against these, these tariff because, you know, he came from the West and, and most people in the West didn't like it. Jackson, however, uh, agreed to it, uh, but he also wanted higher duties on foreign raw materials, which, the New England manufacturers used and the New England manufacturers didn't support. It was a political tactic. He assumed that the New England man votes would kill the entire package, uh, including the higher tariffs on the finished goods that he didn't like. To his and everyone else's surprise, the entire package, in fact, passed as a tariff of 1828. You know, as, as an aside, ironically, Jackson's position did help him win votes in New England later on. But New, in, you know, now now facing higher tariff prices for manufacturing goods they needed, and with the corresponding, uh, you know, higher tariffs on their exports, uh, trade war. Many in the South and West uh, really hated the tariff of 1828. 
and they termed it the Tariff of Abominations. The Tariff of 1828, the Tariff of Abominations, as the South and West called it, yet it was still important in several ways. It represented an impressive new source of revenue for the federal government. It brought in 10 times as mount the revenue as the sale of Western lands. And this was important because uh, by 1836, the federal government had no debt. That was the only time in American history the federal government has had no national debt. Also, the uh, tariff of 1828, you know, is really going to so tick off the people in the South and West, it's going to lead to a constitutional crisis and really help ge generate uh, the second political party system. But we'll talk all about that in the, in the next videos.